thank you. I'm so excited to be here. My mother had a barber shop in West Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And when I was 17 years old, she insisted, just as her father had done with her, that I learn the family trade. Now here's the thing, nothing in me wanted to be a barber. And at the age of 17, I dreamed of doing something that felt so much more glamorous than working with my family in my mother's barber shop. But my mother countered that having a trade was very important, so I would learn it just in case. Now, just in case was a phrase she used a lot. You see, my mother immigrated from Europe to Canada in 1966, and she wasn't certain that my education was going to result in a job, uh, as I was going to be the first member of my entire family to want to attend university. So just in case my schooling didn't work out, I could always go back to barbering. And according to my mother, if a war ever broke out, people would still always need their haircut, so I would always have a job then too, just in case. So it was decided that to put myself through school, I would work in my mother's barbershop with my grandfather and my older sister, Sharon. Now, I love my family dearly, but the truth is I hated it. See, there's a reason I'm not in this picture smiling with the three of them. I had no interest in hair or the particular angle that you need to hold it at and cut it at in order to create a particular shape. So needless to say, I was not a good barber and not near, nowhere near the master that these three were. Now, because I didn't want to be a barber, I had no interest or desire to master the skills. I became increasingly focused on the men who came into my mother's barber shop and sat in my chair. I mean, what could I offer them aside from a great haircut that would make them want to come back to me? And what would make them tell their friends and family about me? And what would make them loyal to me, their barber? Now, these are customer service questions that I was asking myself, but they're also really critically important leadership questions. See, if you hold a leadership position, why should the highly talented men and women who report to you today continue to report to you tomorrow? And why should they authorize you and your leadership and give you their discretionary effort? And what would make them loyal to you, their leader? Now, at my mother's barbershop, I had about half an hour with each client. So half an hour of one-on-one -on -one exclusive time. And since haircut quality was not going to be my forte, I began trying to see if I could make the time that clients spent with me some of the best parts of their day. And so back then, I reasoned, well, I could be the barber with whom people really love to talk, the one who just generally saw them and listened to them and cared about them as people. Now, many of the men who came into my mother's shop were highly respected professionals who worked downtown. However, originally, I didn't know who any of them were or what any of them did, and so I simply treated each the same. Each was a person, a fellow human being, who I started to recognize was tired from the many pressures and demands he felt placed upon him. And I watched as many were desperately trying to balance their personal and professional lives. So the time they had with me, I realized, was likely the only time where they could just sit and do nothing. And it was a time when, well, one, they actually didn't really need to sit and do nothing and not move, because I was actually known to cut ears as well as hair. Um, but it was a time when they weren't forced to play one of their many roles. Because I had no idea if the client was a Supreme Court judge or the president of a multi-million dollar company, to me, at the age of 17, they were just Jack, Sully, Martin. And so I spoke to each of them with honesty, candor, challenging them, bantering with them. And through the process, creating outstanding relationships. I remember one client really well, and I'll call him Al. When Al first came in, he said, please don't trim anything off the top. I looked at Al, I said, Al, you, you don't have a top, it's, it's called a comb over. Do you want me not to trim the side? And he'd laugh and I'd laugh. And he'd say, yeah, nothing off the side. Now years later, I would learn that Al was really high up in our judicial system. And so when he next came into the shop, I said, oh my, Al, you're kind of a really big deal. And he'd say, I know. And I'd say, still nothing off the side? And he'd say, yeah, nothing off the side. And what happened was my clients were no longer just clients, they became friends. And I believe we were simply two people who had genuine respect for one another. And here's what I learned. More than anything else, what we all want is for other people to generally see us and care about us, to tell us the truth, to challenge us, and to stop seeing us as our predetermined roles, whether it be CEO or barber, 
and to start seeing us as people with the potential for greater human connection and greater accomplishment and achievement, regardless of what we may or may not have accomplished in our life thus far. And the key word here is care. When we believe another person generally cares about us and our ultimate success and fulfillment, we will grant that person concessions we won't grant others. See, I was probably the worst barber in my mother's shop. Actually, I'm quite certain I was. But I soon attracted my own following. I mean, clients would come in and wait hours for me or come back another day if I was too busy. And at Christmas time, they brought me gifts. Some even left me $100 tips. Why? Why would they do this? Because these men knew that I loved them. They knew that I cared about them. And because of that, I would have the conversation that needed to be had. I wasn't easily impressed with their positions of power or their perceived wealth. I would challenge them, banter with them, require that they live up to their own highest vision and values for their life, and through the process make some of the time they spent with me some of the best parts of their day. And the payback for me was all of a sudden I began to love my work. I mean, my days became filled with the most incredible men who shared with me their successes, their failures, their passions, their frustrations, their awesome humor and their incredible sadness and grief as I watched them bury loved ones over the years. But we shared life together once a month when they came to visit. And isn't that what we're all here doing anyways? I mean, where is it that we think we're going? See, not one of us gets out of this human experience alive. And so perhaps we're here, as Ram Das has said, to simply help walk each other home. See, what is leadership if not the ability to work extraordinarily well with and through other people, regardless of who reports to whom? And as such, our main task then is to treat other people in such a way that they want to bring all their unique gifts, talents, and discretionary effort forward to achieve a goal, the collective goal of the business. And so it is that each of us must master the art of effectively interacting with other people in order to get anything done. This, above all else, I believe, is the real leadership challenge over the last 16 years, I've had the incredible good fortune to coach thousands of senior level leaders in some of the world's best companies. And I know that the time I spent working in my mother's barber shop taught me more about how to do that well than perhaps all 10 years of my post-secondary formal education. What I know is that every job on our path is important because each one teaches us more about people, how to more effectively connect, engage, and build trust. And these are all things necessary because we can do nothing significant alone. I see so many people today eager to get somewhere and become someone. But then I watch them, and I watch myself included, rush past the only leadership moment that ever exists, which is this moment right here, with the person and the situation right in front of us. And I think one of the reasons we do this is perhaps we're waiting on what we deem to be a more important person to arrive or for the moment of leadership to feel more glamorous than it actually ever does feel. But the moment of leadership is always this moment, right here with the person situation right in front of us. Because how we do anything is how we will do everything. Several years ago, I was brought in to work with a number of senior biotech leaders in San Francisco. And on the morning the work was to begin, I was waiting in the designated office where each leader was gonna meet with me for their one-on-one -on -one coaching session. That particular morning, my first client arrived late, came in rather abruptly, stood over me, and said, look, I don't know how much my company's paying you, but you're 45 minutes, and this better be good. I stood up, said, good morning, my name's Suzanne. That's, um, it's such an interesting way to introduce yourself to someone. Come on in, sit down, let's talk. And so we did. We talked a little bit about what had occurred for him earlier that morning that led to his current emotional state. And I asked him if he approached other individuals in a similar fashion to how he had approached me that morning. And he said he did with some groups of people, but not with others. I shared a little bit about the impact his behavior had on me and how I thought that was relevant for his greatest effectiveness and success. And then we discussed alternative ways he might have handled himself that particular morning. After about an hour, we stood up, shook hands, said goodbye. The next day, I received a very thoughtful email from him to say this. Thank you for seeing me. 
and for the insight into my behavior. Few have ever called me out on it. I'll be taking some of your advice. But here's the thing. I never gave him any advice. I simply shared the impact his behavior had on me and asked him if he thought it was effective. So the advice he was referring to was his own advice to himself. See, we all know we can be better and higher versions of ourselves, but I don't know a single human being who can live that consistently, perfectly every day. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's really hard to be human, and it's hard to be a good human, and perhaps even more challenging is to be an exceptional senior level leader in our world today. I mean, we are living through an unprecedented time of technological advancement, globalization, and the amount of information that comes at each of us is absolutely relentless. So perhaps we're meant to be more kind and compassionate to our fellow human travelers. So, what if your next interaction is the moment of leadership, the only leadership moment that ever exists? And what if the job you have right now is the very best place for you to learn more about people and therefore business? And what if each of us, as we interacted with other people, in the moment that we interacted with them, just generally cared about them and their ultimate success? I wonder what would be possible. Now, over the last 13 years, the Leadership Circle organization has tracked the effectiveness of more than 60,000 C-suite and senior level leaders in more than 10,000 organizations and in 171 countries. What they have found is those leaders who lead with integrity, with courageous authenticity, with a caring connection to other people and a concern for their community, outperform in a concrete business sense those leaders who do not. <coughs> now, when I discovered this body of research, I was personally over the moon because I've always wanted to believe that doing the right thing and doing right by people matters. And now there's research to prove that it does. That love wins, but only always. So just in case, leadership really is nothing other than the ability to work extraordinarily well with and through other people, the people in your life right now. And just in case what you do really matters, that you are that powerful, that the words you say, the thoughts you think, the actions you take, they have the power to make or break another person's day. Lead with kindness, compassion, and love, and from that, may you sense the incredible power that you have to set the tone of every relationship you're a part of, and from that have the greatest potential to create the kind of world we all want to live in. Lead with love as if it was a concrete business imperative and your greatest professional competitive advantage, just in case it is. Thank you.